Oh. Just give everyone a few moments to come in from the waiting room. As a reminder, please mute yourself unless you are testifying before the board. Good afternoon. This is a hearing before the licensing board for the city of Boston. Today is Tuesday, June 29th. Before I review procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the licensing board. And today I'm joined by Commissioner Liam Curran and Commissioner Kiana Saxon. Thank you. As a reminder, today's hearing is being recorded and will be posted to the city of Boston's website. Please ensure that your camera function and your audio function are working and be ready to turn them on when you are called. I will read each item into the agenda in the order it appears, after which I will ask who is present on behalf of the licensee, who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department, and whether there are any individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify. After that, I will uh, swear all parties in, the police report will be read into the record, and the licensee or counsel will have the opportunity to address the board before questions. Calling 173 Milk Street, Inc., doing business as Coogan's Bluff, located at 171 to 173 Milk Street. The date of the incident was March 5th, 2020. Assault and battery, serious injury, employee on patron in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, Chapter 265, Section 13A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good afternoon, uh, Commissioners and uh, Ms. Hawkins. Uh, this is Attorney Bill Burke representing uh, the company. I am uh, here with Brendan Glynn, the manager of record, and Sheldon Cohen of the operations uh, department for the Glynn Hospitality Group. Also present is uh, Caroline Friedman, a, a law clerk in our firm, who uh, will just observe. Thank you. Who will be testifying on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Uh, Detective Juba, I see, is present. Uh, um, and if necessary, I can read the initial police report. And Detective Juba can uh, um, read the investigative report. Detective Juba, can you hear us? I don't see him, but why don't we, um, we can proceed with the police report. Lieutenant, uh, before I swear all parties in, are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Seeing no one. Good, good, good afternoon, Dave Juba. Can you hear me now? I can, Detective. Could you turn on your video, please? Okay, let me get this here. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, could all parties please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, please proceed with the police report. Detective, are you reading in the initial report? Or is- I believe, I believe, the, I believe the lieutenant is gonna read in the initial report and then I'll read the uh, supplemental. Thank you very much. Uh, Lieutenant Detective Troy from the Boston Police Department, uh, reading from a report authored by uh, Officer Ray Doyley on March 6, 2020. About 1053, um, Officer Doyle responded for a radio call to 170 Mil uh, 171 Milk Street, Coogan's Bar for a sick assist with uh, help in hospitals for a man bleeding. <laughs> on arrival, uh, Officer met ambulance number one and, vic uh, and victim Bruce Bott on scene. Victim was in the process of being transported to MGH after a fight outside Coogan's. According to witness, a friend, uh, Mr. Brendan McGoggin, who was intoxicated and uh, he and the victim were drinking somewhere over in Davis Square in Somerville and decided to go to Coogan's and uh, Milk Street. Witness and victim attempted to gain entry into Coogan's and were denied. The witness, that's uh, Mr. McGoggin, st stated that an argument ensued and fists started flying and he saw a victim lying on the sidewalk near the curb unconscious. Victor's, uh, victim uh, suffered major injuries including bleeding from the ears and large bruise to the left facial or left cheek. Victim was transported unconscious to Mass General by ambulance number one uh, for further medical treatment by Dr. David Peake and the acute team. Victim remained unresponsive, unresponsive at uh, Mass General and was further transported to the ICU ward Ellison 4 where his condition was upgraded to stable. Um, 
Ian certified Sergeant Detective Talbot responded to MGH and spoke with the attending physician who stated the victim had life-threatening injuries. Sergeant uh, Detective Talbot then uh, initiated full notifications and responded to 171 Milk Street to establish a crime scene. And that's where the uh, second report, Detective Juba's report will pick up. Okay, good afternoon once again. I'm going to read from a uh, supplemental police report that was documented by Sergeant Detective Michael Talbot. On Thursday, March 5th, 2020 at 11, 12 p.m., Sergeant Detective Talbot, while in the area of A1 Detective's office, was notified by Lieutenant Osberg that there was an unconscious male patient suffering from head trauma at Mass General Hospital. Sergeant Detective Talbot responded to Mass General Hospital and met with Officer Doyle in the emergency room area. Officer Doyle stated that the male victim was currently being worked on by the medical staff for life-threatening head injuries sustained as a result of an assault and battery committed by employees of Coogan's Bluff Bar located at, one, located at 171 Milk Street. Officer Doyle then introduced Sergeant Detective Talbot to an eyewitness who, who, is, friend, who is friends with the victim. Sergeant Detective Talbot noticed that McLaughlin was highly intoxicated and having difficult, difficulty standing. McLaughlin stated that he was with the victim inside Coogan's, inside Coogan's drinking when they exited to get fresh air. Once outside, McLaughlin stated, McLaughlin and, and the other victim were denied the entry by the door staff due to their intoxicated state. According to McLaughlin, an argument ensued, ensued between the staff and the victim, at which point punches were thrown at the victim by the staff. McLaughlin stated that he stated, McLaughlin stated that he saw the victim knocked out, laying on the ground, but did not see who hit the victim. Sergeant Detective Talbot then spoke to the treating doctor who reported that the victim was still unconscious, suffering from possible life-threatening brain, brain bleed, and he needed to be incubated because he was unable to breathe on his own. Based on the doctor's belief that the victim's injuries were life-threatening, Sergeant Detective Talbot requested that the homicide unit be notified to respond and assume control of the investigation. Sergeant Mackey, Sergeant Talbot, Sergeant Levy, Detective Juba, Detective Hall Brewster, Sergeant Detective Gallagher, and Officers Burke and Reither responded to 171 Milk Street Cougars Bar to locate and secure the crime scene. Upon arrival, Sergeant Mackey and Sergeant Detective Talbot secured the area pending the arrival of assisting units. Sergeant, Tec Sergeant Detective Levy and Sergeant Detective Gallagher secu secured the bar area and identified potential witnesses to the incident. While securing the scene, Sergeant Mackey and Sergeant Detective Talbot were approached by witness number one, known to the Commonwealth, who reported he witnessed the assault. Witness number one reported th that he witnessed three employees of Coogan's beating the victim until he was unconscious on the ground. The witness believed to be the victim might be dead based on the severity of the beating he witnessed. Witness number one then informed Sergeant Mackey and Sergeant Talbot that he videotaped the incident and captured the beating on video, which included audio of the incident. Sergeant Detective Talbot then watched the video, which showed the victim complaining to Coogan's employee, manager on duty, later identified as suspect number one, Anthony Papa. The victim complained that the staff physically threw him out the bar, stating to suspect number one, Papa, you just tossed me on my ass. At which point the suspect, number one, Papa, responds, yeah, that's because you tried to come back in. The victim then walks closer towards the suspect, number one, Papa, at which point Papa pushes the victim backwards with an arm to the chest. The victim and suspect, Papa, then began, then bear hugged each other and began to wrestle. Suspect one Papa then delivers several knee blows to the victim's leg. Suspect one Papa then was joined by another employee later, later identified as Alexander James as they continued to wrestle with the victim. Suspect Papa and suspect James then physically lifted up the victim and tossed him backwards onto the pavement. The victim falls backwards, striking his head on the pavement as the suspect 
lands on top of him. The victim appeared to be knocked unconscious from the fall and lays motionless, motionless on the pavement. Suspect one Papa is observed on video punching the unconscious victim repeatedly about the body as he lays motionless on the pavement. At the same time, suspect number two, Jane, is observed repeatedly striking the victim as he lays motionless on the paper. I'm sorry. Uh, at the same time, suspect number two, Jane, is observed repeatedly striking the victim in the head area with vicious blows as he lays unconscious on the pavement. This attack was so violent that the hollow sounds of suspect two's punches hitting the victim's head can clearly be heard on the videotape. The attack by the suspect only stopped when bystanders were yelling, bro, he's out, he's out, as they continued to beat the victim. The victim laid unconscious on the pavement until being removed from the scene by Boston EMS in critical condition. Sergeant Detective Talbot was then approached by the Glenn Group Manager, Sheldon Cohen, who oversees management of Coogan's. Mr. Cohen asked if the Boston police need a video of the incident and Sergeant Detective informed him that Sergeant Detective Sullivan from Homicide Unit was responding and taking control of the investigation. Several minutes later, Mr. Cohen approached Sergeant, Det Sergeant Detective Talbot again and handed him two thumb drives that Coogan claimed captured the incident. Mr. Cohen stated that the video showed three of his employees involved in an altercation with the patron. He witnessed on video, two of the employees beat the victim unconscious. Mr. Cohen then brought all three employees to Sergeant Detective to make them available for interviews. Mr. Cohen confirmed that the, the identity of suspect one as Anthony Papa. Mr. Cohen confirmed the, the identity of suspect two as Alexander James. Mr. Cohen identified a third employee as Aziga Silla. However, the video showed that this employee was not involved in the assault. These three employees were immediately separated from each other and transported to the homicide unit for interviews. Sergeant Detective Mark Sullivan and Detective Lombardo of the homicide unit arrived on scene and assumed control of the investigation. Multiple witnesses were identified on scene and transported to the homicide unit for, in for interviews conducted by Sergeant Detective Evans, Sergeant Detective Barrett, Detective De La Hante, Detective Hall Brewster, Detective Juba, and Detective Heron. Sergeant Detective Sullivan and Detective Lombardo and Sergeant Detective Talbot did review the video from Coogan's, which showed the bar staff physically tossed the victim out of the front door area of the bar onto the sidewalk. The victim is then observed hanging about the area of the bar until the time of the previously described video begins. The victim, the crime scene was processed by the crime scene unit, Sergeant Detective Blando, Santilia, and P.O. West. Sergeant Detective Victor Evans of the homicide unit and Detective Juba, they conduct post Miranda interviews at the Boston Police Homicide Unit with suspect number one, Anthony Papa. The interview was, rec was video and audio rec recorded. During the interview, suspect number one, Papa stated that the victim and the victim's friends were inside Coogan's and they were acting extremely intoxicated. Such that one Papa stated that they kicked both males out of the bar, but the two repeatedly attempted to re-enter the establishment. Such that Papa stated that he was in a verbal argument outside of the bar with the victim when the victim walked towards him and he put his hands up to stop the advancement. He then claims that the victim put, his, put him in a headlock, forcing them to fall to the pavement. Suspect one Papa stated that while they were on the ground, he struck the victim several times in the body area to release the victim's grip from the headlock. Suspect one Papa stated that he stopped delivering blows to the victim when he was released from the headlock. Suspect one stated that he never saw the suspect striking, he never saw the second suspect striking the victim because he was in the headlock. Sergeant Detective Evans showed suspect one Papa the video of the incident and the suspect identified himself in the video. Sergeant Detective Victor Evans of the Homicide Unit and Detective Juba did conduct a post Miranda interview at Boston Police Homicide Unit with suspect number two, Alexander James. The interview was video and audio recorded. 
during the interview, suspect two Jane stated that the victim bought and the victims and the victim's friend were inside Coogan's and they did and they were acting extremely intoxicated. Sussex stated that they kicked both males out of the bar, but two attempted, they repeatedly attempted to re-enter the establishment. Suspect two Jane stated that he witnessed the victim, he, he, went, he witnessed the victim put the suspect Papa in the headlock, forcing him to fall to the pavement. Suspect James reported that he witnessed the victim hit his head on the ground as he fell backwards. Suspect two Jane stated that he witnessed the victim choking the suspect while they were laying on the ground. So he struck the victim once or twice in the air area to release his grip. Suspect two Jane stated that he stopped delivering blows to the victim when he heard someone in the crowd yelling, he's knocked out. Sergeant Detective Evans showed the suspect James a video of the incident and the suspect identified himself in the video. It should be noted that the suspect's versions of the events is inconsistent with the videos, with the video evidence obtained. It is clear from the video that the victim is physically attacked twice before he engages the suspect Papa with a mutual headlock. It is clear from the video that both suspects lift the victim and force him backwards onto the pavement with no ways to protect himself from the fall. The fall results in the victim being knocked unconscious and unable to defend himself. Both suspects then repeatedly strike the unconscious victim. Both suspects were placed under arrest for assault and battery, as well as assault and battery resulting in serious bodily injury. Both suspects were booked in a normal manner at Area A1, pending transfer to Boston Municipal Court for arraignment. License premise violation to be issued to Coogan's Bluff for intoxicated patrons and assault and battery, seriously bodily injury, employee on patron. And that concludes uh, Sergeant Detective's portion of his supplemental report. And uh, finally, I will uh, read from my supplemental report from the license premise um, inspection violation. On uh, March 7, 2020, Detective Juba and Sergeant Detective Talbot respond to Coogan Bar 171 Milk Street to conduct a license premise inspection. Detectives issued Coogan's Bar a violation for assault and battery serious injury that occurred on March 5th, 2020. License premise violation number 001677 was signed for by manager Sheldon Cohen. Sheldon Cohen cooperated with the police department throughout the investigation. And uh, those will be um, the reports that I have to read on file. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Burke, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Delaney Hawkins. Um, I have here, and I'm gonna ask uh, for the commission to hear from uh, Sheldon Cohen, who was the uh, operations manager on duty at the time, and he'll tell you about his role. He came to the scene afterwards because part of his duties would be that he had traveled throughout the city to the various other establishments and uh, he got a call and responded. Brendan Glynn is here because he is the manager of record. He was not present uh, on the evening in question, doesn't have any firsthand information other than being a participant in the, in the decision the next day to terminate the two individuals involved, Mr. James and Mr. Papa. Um, Mr. Mr. Glynn is here if any of the commissioners have any questions for him, but, but I, I, let me just start at the outset to state that uh, I have on behalf of Coogan's been dealing with Mr. Bott's attorney and I'm informed by Mr. Bott's attorney that Mr. Bott has made a very, very, very good recovery from this uh, terrible incident. Uh, he did suffer facial fractures and he does have a, a vision problem in the lower part of his right eye that continued to bother him, but he does not have any cognitive deficit or any traumatic brain injury as a result of this incident, as I'm informed by his attorney. So I wanted to impart that um, and, and also to let you know, of course, that there is uh, the the threat anyway of a civil action in the case. And we have a mediation in the case scheduled for the latter part of July of this year. But 
let me turn to the incident in question. Uh, Mr. Cohen is here. He has been placed under oath. So Mr. Cohen, just state your name for the record, please. Sheldon Cohen. And our, what, how are you employed? Uh, operations manager for Flint Hospitality. All right. And on the evening of March 5th of 2020, were you also employed in that capacity? I was. And did you become aware of an incident at Coogan's at about 10, 1030 in the evening? I did, yes. Tell me how you became in, uh, informed of that. I was between Back Bay restaurants, Cleary's and Dillon's, and I got a phone call uh, or a text that something had happened at Coogan's and you need to get down there right away. So I headed right down there. When you arrived, were there police present at the scene? I arrived in park and an ambulance was pulling away. Okay. And uh, subsequently, did police officers come and conduct an investigation? They did. All right. And did you conduct your own investigation? Yes. All right. What did you find out from your investigation about what had transpired? Um, from what I heard in the beginning, it sounded, you know, it was, it was very vague. I didn't find out more until later. Um, it was a very short period of time uh, when the detectives arrived. Um, they had told me what had happened or the, the seriousness of it and the state of the kid at the hospital. So I went and pulled some video to my own just to see exactly what happened. So there was no um, discrepancy. And I made a couple copies. And that's when I come back down to talk to Detective Sergeant Talbot again, and I gave him the copies. All right. And you, and you gave the copies of the videotapes from the exterior surveillance? Yes. All right. And um, have you been contacted by Boston Police concerning this incident since the night in question? Uh, maybe I saw Detective Juba the next day for the license presence, but uh, I don't recall it. It was a year and a half ago, right. so, but not, well, nothing recent. Other, I mean, insofar as any requests for cooperation from the Boston Police Department, have you given them that cooperation? Yes, even that night when, you know, when I realized who was involved from both sets of videotapes, I took Detective Talbot to them and brought them to Detective Talbot. Okay. Uh, the two individuals, Mr. Papa, uh, Anthony Papa is the first individual. Well, what was his role uh, at Coogan's on the night in question? He was the manager on duty. And how long had he, had he been a manager on duty or a manager at uh, Coogan's? Uh, at Coogan's, well, he, he'd been with us for about three or four years, worked his way up from a waiter bar back. He had managed the previous summer at Sterling's. He'd probably been at Coogan's six months or so at that time, just lateral move. Okay. seasonally okay and uh and alexander james is the other individual what was his role in the night in question he was a you know door guy checked ids he worked for us on two occasions he worked for us for over a year he left us to go work at a place close to his house in brookline just transportation was an issue that place uh closed or got sold and he came back to us so he came back to us probably six to ten months something like that and so far as Mr. Papa's record of employment with your organization, had, had he ever had any disciplinary problems? No, not at all. Had he ever been involved in a, an assault type case, uh, an assault by an employee on patron no. or an employee on employee or any other issue like that? No, he had made the transition from working the floor to management. He was doing actually very well. He picked it up. He was level head in stressful situations with the restaurant. This was very out of character, to say the least. With respect to Mr. James, uh, had he ever exhibited any untoward behavior with patrons or been aggressive with patrons? No, that's why we had him on the front door and I, with IDs because he was fairly soft-spoken, mild man, and he was good at checking IDs, but he was not a, he was not a hothead for a better word. Was he an army veteran? He was an army veteran. And, and was there ever an, uh, an assault or battery type issue between him and any patrons or any other employees at the organization? No. Did either one of these individuals have a criminal record as far as you know? As far as I know, no. Okay. And w uh, just briefly describe for me the training that one has for, uh, with respect to Mr. James for uh, being a doorman. It's mostly on the job training, is it not? Yeah, it's mostly on the job training. He, you know, especially the second time 
we were familiar with him because he had worked for us for you know a year plus um and i knew he had worked at other bars in the city in the same position um, he came highly recommended initially the first time and even coming back the second time it was it was actually welcome back it was good to have him back because um there was never an issue with him he was good at what he did until this does your organization have an employee manual that sets out the duties and the expectations for people that are uh, working on security and on the door? Yes. And, and does it include that there's not to be any aggressive action or physical contact unless absolutely necessary to protect life? Yeah, that's in there multiple times and it's drilled into their heads by me personally that if there's a situation, someone's giving you a hard time, Call the police. If you don't think you should call the police, call the police anyways. Call, you know, call them in for everything. Likewise with Mr. Papa, with respect to his training, he's also subject to the employee manual that proscribes certain behavior, such as aggressive behavior with patrons. Yes. Physical contact with patrons is not condoned or in any way encouraged or allowed? Allowed, yeah. Okay. So in the prescription is to call the police if there's an issue? Yes. Um, uh, was there any way in, in, for you in your position to have forecast on this evening in question that either one of these individuals was capable of the actions that appear to be portrayed in the videos we have? None whatsoever. It was a, it was a Wednesday night. It was a fairly quiet night. It was very laid back. It was not a stressful situation. It was, it shouldn't have happened. Was it unexpected from your yes. point of view? Yes. I don't have any other questions of, uh, of uh, either one of these gentlemen, uh, the commissioners do. Um, I, would, I would simply point out that, that both of them had exemplary records with the Glen Ogden organization. They had been trained. They had never uh, shown any propensity to any violence. The incident that is depicted in the video is, is uh, graphically, um, it's difficult to watch. Uh, Mr. Bott suffered a beating. Um, thank God he has made a very good recovery. He was employed at Oracle at the time. He was never laid off, stayed with Oracle, is still with them, and his career is basically, as I understand it, uninterrupted. Uh, and thankfully, he did not suffer, as I said, cognitive difficulties as a result of this incident. Um, it, it, you know, our, our manual is quite clear. This behavior is not countenanced in any way. And the termination of the two individuals was a measure that was immediately taken the next morning uh, in light of the circumstances in a review of the, uh, of the video from, uh, from the incident. I really have nothing further to offer at this juncture. Coogan's has been closed uh, for 14 months now and I'm not aware that there's a uh, present plan uh, for a time to reopen. I just don't know. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, so Coogan's remains closed? Coogan's has not reopened since it was closed down, correct? OK. Um, how many staff were, on the, were working this evening? Total staff? Yeah. In including bartenders and how many security staff did you have on that night or or non bar staff? Maybe six. Probably six. Yep. And how crowded would you say it was that night? 50% of capacity or less. And you said it was a Wednesday night? Yes. Um, I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Curran? Yes, um, I have a question about the, the handbook. Uh, how is that conveyed to the employees? It's electronically. It's when they do their onboarding to, to start employment before they can get paid anything else. It's in a PDF with that. And they, they sign something acknowledging they received it or read it or they quizzed on it? Um, they have to check off that, you know, they have to go through it to proceed on that. 
Uh, as far as I quizzed on it, I mean, it's all pretty much on the job. It's, you know, very basic and specific. Um, we work hand in hand with them on any, I do personally on, on those nights um, that they're on. And uh, in December of 2018, you were uh, cited for an employee on patron incident. Do you recall that? I don't. Okay, so would you recall if anything was done uh, either at Coogan's or throughout your company to reconvey the importance of incidents where employees on patrons? It's reconveyed, you know, shift by shift. When people are hired, it's always, you know, it's always on the top of my mind. Um, I can, uh, if, if I may, Commissioner Curran, I, I, if I can address that. I, I, I know after that incident and, and virtually after all of these, um, the uh, Gerard McHale, former Boston Police Department superintendent, uh, is employed in, in security by the organization uh, up until the, the close down with, with COVID. But he would, he would go around to the folks and, and re-emphasize the, the requirements under the handbook and also to make sure if there's an incident, call the Boston Police Department. So measures were undertaken by him. I also had presented materials and uh, to various people in the organization concerning the need to, uh, uh, you know, stand by what's in the manual, no physical contact and call up the Boston Police when any incident arises. And how long had, uh, it's Mr. Bott is the, how long had he been there, Mr. Bott, correct? Well, reading from the, uh, from the police reports, he had not been at Coogan's for a terribly long period of time. Apparently he and his friend were at a place in Davis Square in Somerville prior to coming to Coogan's. Uh, did you do any independent investigation of his, his time there and what he consumed while he was in your establishment? We did an investigation. We did uncover a credit card receipt for $10.73 or something like that charged to his credit card, uh, to Mr. Bott's credit card. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Saxon. Yeah, how long did the whole incident last? Um, the, the, the incident outside the bar? Yeah, from the time that the security uh, did not allow him to come back in. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't have the exact numbers on it, but I don't, I don't believe it's any more than a minute. And how many people were, so the, from the six security people, there was one in the report that um, the detective Duba um, read that he was not involved, but how many staff do you know were outside watching that incident? We had two people involved. How many staff were, were witnesses? It's my understanding that there were three people outside. From what I saw from the video, there was Alex and Tony who were involved in it. The third suspect, the third, third employee was trying to separate and keep everything broken up and everybody else was inside. And maybe it was stated in the report, but who called the police? It says in the police report, it was a bystander. Thank you. Thank you very much. The board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you all. Thank you. Calling LCTV Fort Point LLC, doing business as Lolita, Cusina, and Tequila Bar, located 53 Summer Street. The date of the incident was May 5th, 2021. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise in violation of Nash General Law, Chapter 138, Section 34A, 34C, and 64 to 64A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Kristen Scanlon for the licensee, and Mark um, Malatesta, who's one of the owners, is also present along with the general manager, Bianca Malatesta. And who will be testifying on behalf of the Boston Police Department? I will be. Detective Fernandez. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? 
Sergeant Detective Gallagher, if need be. Thank you, Sergeant. Could all parties please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I do. Please proceed with the police report. Good afternoon. I'll be reading out the police report, which I wrote on a Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. At about 8.30 p.m., Sergeant Detective Willem Gallagher and Detective Eddie Hernandez assigned to a licensed supremacist unit under the direct supervision of Lieutenant Detective Adrian Troy were performing checks of the bars and restaurants during the COVID-19 emergency. While walking into Lolita Seaport, located at 253 Summer Street, detectives observed a table of two male patrons drinking alcoholic beverages. Detectives observed that these males uh, looked young. Detectives asked the patrons to produce identification to confirm their ages. Both individuals stated they were over 21 years of age and produced Massachusetts driver's license that appeared as uh, though they were both over 21 years of age. Upon further investigation, detectives observed, uh, were able to confirm the identity of one of the patrons, Jofer, Joseph Rinaldi. The second person, uh, patron later identified as Matthew Ferreira, provided detectives with a fraudulent driver's license that contained his name, but displayed the date of birth that made it appear as though he was over 21 years of age. Detectives used a license verification program, which confirmed that, that the driver's license was indeed fraudulent. The fraudulent driver's license was confiscated by detectives. Mr. Uh, Ferreira will be summoned to court for possession, persons under 21 in possession of alcohol and possession of fraudulent identification. Mr. Rinaldi will be summoned to court for procuring alcohol for a person under 21 years of age. Uh, detectives brought this situation to the attention of the person in charge, Ms. Bianca Molotesta. As a result of what detectives observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued the license premise inspection notice 048009 for persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise. Ms. Molotesta signed for and accepted the notice. That is all. Thank you. Attorney Scanlon, would you like to address the alleged incident? Uh, yes, please. I have no questions for uh, Detective Hernandez or Sergeant Detective Gallagher at this time, but as the police report indicated, the incident occurred on a Wednesday evening, um, May 5th. At this time, the restaurant was still operating under COVID restrictions, so there was no bar service. Patrons were seated in the dining room. Uh, there was no incident with this table prior to police arriving. The two patrons indicated one of age. Um, were seated at a table and were carded by staff and produced at the time what appeared to be um, valid Massachusetts um, IDs. Both owners, uh, Mark Malatesta and Chris Jamison, were on premises that evening, as well as Bianca Malatesta, who is the general manager. And here today, um, I'd like to uh, ask her a few questions, if I may. Um, Bianca, to confirm you were on premises that evening, correct? You're muted. Yes, I was. And was anyone checking IDs at the door that evening? I don't believe so. I can't remember. Uh, what days do you usually have employees checking IDs at the door? Generally, it's just Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And what time do they start? Um, Saturday, Friday. Thursday, Friday, are usually around seven. Um, if it's busier, they'll start earlier. And are all staff um, and wait, including wait staff tips certified on premises? Yes, they are. Are they required to keep their certifications current? Yes, they are. And other than tips, do you train staff on ID checking on a regular basis? We do. And how often is that conducted? Um, multiple times a week, we go through IDs. We have a collection of fake IDs at this point that we've confiscated. So we'll compare those to real IDs, kind of show what we're looking for, um, follow the trends as the IDs do tend to change. Um, but we always have trainings multiple times a week. If a patron produces a, what is believed to be a fake ID, how is staff instructed to handle this? Um, so they'll come and get a manager immediately. Um, we'll approach the table generally say, you know, sorry, we can't accept this. Um, we believe this to be a fake ID and therefore we're going to confiscate it and the entire party has to leave. Um, often we get a lot of pushback, but 
you know, if we're not confident in the ID, we take it and the whole party has to go. And what if the staff isn't sure on the validity of the ID? Same thing? Same thing. They'll get a manager involved and then we'll come and talk to the guest. Uh, but they always take the ID if they have any question about it at all and bring it right to a manager. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, I know this licensee has spoken about this issue in the past, but to reiterate, they do have a uh, strong policy that um, they don't take foreign IDs, they rarely take out of state IDs, they are diligent in repeated and frequent training regarding proper identification that's allowed and acceptable in order to um, sell and serve alcohol to its patrons. They do have a full-time host on weekends checking IDs on the way in and they often turn people away. Even if one person has a party in the party has a fake ID, they go so far as to turn down the whole table. And further than that, um, they flag it internally across all of their restaurants so that those particular patrons aren't allowed to come in again or make reservations at any of their licensed establishments. Um, oftentimes, uh, staff is met with patrons who are upset because they won't take foreign IDs or if they're confiscated, um, they tell them, tell the patrons to call the police if they want it, if they want the license back and lo and behold, they don't call the police or don't come back for the ID because what has been confiscated is a fake. So the restaurant is incredibly diligent about policing this. Um, it is unfortunately an issue that I know the board has seen outside um, this particular licensee that the increased sophistication of licenses um, uh, is an issue. And I mean, kids time and time again as evidenced even in, here by uh, the Grace, police. Do you have any more you wanna add about this incident? Yes, that's where I was going. With this particular incident, they patrons become so brazen as to lie to the face of police about their fake IDs because they're confident that they'll either scan or otherwise be accepted as valid, which is what happened here. So, you know, the licensee is diligent. There's sometimes technical error, sometimes human error, but, but they do everything in their power to avoid the issue from occurring. Unfortunately, this one did slip through. Uh, they're certainly happy to answer any questions that the board may have regarding this incident or their policies. I do have some questions. Um, first of all, do we all remember that we were you were before us not more than a month ago on the same issue? Yes, I, I was the one that spoke um, at that hearing. This had had happened prior to our okay. to our hearing. Mr. Malatesta, you were in the business of um, you were you were in the in the bar business, right? In the restaurant business, yes. In the restaurant business, your responsibility to um, do a better job checking IDs. That's your responsibility. Okay. Yes. And to pass it on to your staff. I return to my detective and my sergeant who were there that night. Can you tell me a little bit about your conversation with the owners that night? Do you think that they appreciated the seriousness of this offense? Uh, was sergeant Chetif Gallagher, it, it was Cinco de Mayo and it was kind of a theme night for us where we're, we're targeting, uh, if you want to use that word, uh, places we thought would be busy with the holiday. And uh, we're back at the latest specific for that. And it, like you said, uh, Madam Chair, this was shortly after our last visit where we did grab a couple more underage kids and uh, I think it was a table of four and we, we were walking through and, uh, you know, lo and behold, I saw this table that uh, there were two sitting at it and one looked very young and was indeed underage and, you know, we, we showed them what we use. We, we told them it's very tough to rely on the, uh, you know, the naked eye to find these things and, you know, there are scanners that are available that, that aren't that expensive and, we, we showed them how we use it. We went through the whole process, but we, we're there for quite a while. They, they were quite interested. We showed them how it worked and uh, we scanned a couple of IDs there that night. And, uh, you know, I thought we made a little success. I know on weekends, they do have a gentleman. We were there last weekend dealing with another issue. And there is a gentleman at the door on Fridays and Saturdays, but you know, some of these places are busy five, six days a week. And this is a popular place. And, uh, Two days a week probably isn't going to cut it. Uh, Detective Fernandez. Well, I, I, I had a uh, conversation with Mr. Malatesta on one of those nights, and um, I explained to him that if he's relying just on purely just visually identifying, that's how these get in. And uh, Mr. Malatesta explained 
they actually bragged that he had a whole bunch of tables that they turned away. Um, and I explained to him that that's not a good thing that they're having all these people think that they can come through. And he said, stated something to the effect that it didn't matter because it wasn't going to result in a violation. Thank you. No, no, the, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll have to disagree with that. I said, we're doing the best we can. And, and, and you know, if I've turned away, I actually had turned away seven tables in a row on Cinco de Mayo for fake IDs. Um, I take the violations incredibly seriously in our staff and training everything here. I think the, the question here is the ta this table specifically, the server who had checked their IDs did not bring it to management attention that they thought it was in any way not a valid ID. So we would not, had we had the scanner at that time, have even you have scanned. Scanners now? You have scanners now? Have you invested in scanners? Not that they're- We did attempt uh, to get the program that I uh, was shown by Detective Hernandez. Uh, both myself, our director of operations and another manager have tried to download it. It says put in your email to you know sign up with a group and then you never get anything. I even attempted again today prior to the hearing to see if anything had changed. Okay, well, the burden is on you as a licensee um, to figure this out. And if you ha are now have a reputation of allowing people who are under 21 in, you're gonna continue to have problems before the, bo the board. We have found that we're getting a lot less now that we are, have been, you know, had had heavy pressure on, on this focus. And I would say, uh, you know, over the last four weeks or so, it's gone significantly better. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Curran, Commissioner Saxon, do you? No questions, thank you. Board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Item three is daily schedule. Calling C and G Corp Inc. doing business as L Street Market located at 77 L Street. The date of the incident was March 26, 2021. Illegality taking place on premise. Employee arrested for illegal drug sale in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Present on behalf of the licensee. Oh, yes, good afternoon, um, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Attorney Hawkins. My name is Carolyn Conway. Uh, my business address is 350 West Broadway. I have with me today Mr. Chris Castagna, who is the manager of the premises. And also, he's been going in and out. I've seen him on Albert Miskinis, who is a witness. Thank you. Who's going to be testifying on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Sergeant Detective Gallagher will uh, read the uh, C6 drug unit its report as well as his supplemental if no officers from C6 are here. Thank you. I don't believe I see anyone from C6. Um, are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Could all McGinnis is in. Yeah, Mr. McGinnis, the Skinnis was there two seconds ago. Oh, on me. Oh, there he is. I'm <laughs> Right here, it keeps kicking me out. Could you could all please raise your hand? Yeah. Uh, Chris, you've got to raise your hand too. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant, please proceed with the police report. Yes, good morning, ma'am. Chair, members of the board, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, reading report written by officers. At about 1 p.m. Friday, 3 26 21 members of the district c6 drug control unit were working under the direction of sergeant charbonnier when the area of l street and east 4th street south boston conducting surveillance of the shell gas station located at 77 l street within the past few months officers received information relative to drug activity involving an individual identified as mark watson suspect number one Officers learned that Watson was a gas attendant at the gas station. During one of the times of surveillance being conducted, officers observed Watson meet up with an Hispanic male operating a black Ford Explorer, bearing Mass Reg 9 X-ray Victor 285, identified as Anthony Garcia, suspect number two, who was parked in the corner of the gas station. Watson stopped pumping gas and walked to Garcia's vehicle and spoke with him through the driver's side open window for a brief moment, then went back to pumping gas. Garcia left a short time afterward in an unknown direction. On this particular day, Friday, 3-26-21, Sergeant Charbonnier, along with Officer Dodd, noticed the same Ford Explorer parked in the corner of the Shell gas station parking lot 
with Garcia in the driver's seat. Watson walked to the driver's side of the Explorer with his hand in his pocket while looking in all directions. Watson in, leaned inside the open driver's window in an inconspicuous manner, conducting what appeared to be a hand-to-hand -hand transaction with Garcia. Watson then got back into his motor vehicle, a 2005 Eon bearing Mass Reg 174 Whiskey 20, which was also parked in the parking lot and appeared to place something near the dashboard area. Garcia eventually left the gas station. Officers queried Garcia's license plate, which revealed Garcia to have recent arrests on 3221 for possession with intent to distribute Class A and possession with intent to distribute Class B and unlawful possession of a firearm. Believing a drug transaction had taken place, Sergeant Chabonier, operating department motor vehicle equipped with blue lights and siren, conducted a motor vehicle stop at the Explorer on Marine Road by I Street. P.O. Dodd approached the driver's side and spoke with Garcia, requesting his driver's license. Garcia appeared, appeared distracted and nervous, handing over his license, which was wrapped in a piece of paper. P.O. Dodd asked Garcia where he was coming from. He replied, I was just smoking weed with my cousin Mark. When he asked where Mark's last name was, he stated Watson. While speaking with Garcia, Sergeant Chabonier observed what appeared to be a weapon in a case tucked beneath the passenger seat in the Santa Claus console. Additionally, Officer Dodd noticed a folding knife in the Santa console well within Garcia's reaching distance. Based on the observations made at the gas station, along with the weapons within Garcia's reach, P.O. Dodd had Garcia step from the vehicle. Garcia's left leg was in a cast and he informed officers that he had been shot in the left recently. Pat Frisk was conducted of Garcia for weapons, no additional weapons located on his person. P.O. Dodd noticed what appeared to be a large sum of money in Garcia's left pants pocket. Garcia stated, I have $900 in my pocket. Sergeant Chabonier moved a large knife that was fastened inside a black case holster from the passenger seat and sent a console. Another large knife also in a case was located in the back seat. Upon looking in the center console for additional weapons, Sergeant Chabonier located a clear plastic bag containing 11 individually wrapped clear plastic bags of what appeared to be cocaine, approximately 18 grams. An additional $1,858 was located next to the suspect's cocaine. Officers placed Garcia in handcuffs and he was transported back to District C6 by Officers Carr and Manforte in the Fox 101. Florida Explorer was also brought back to C6 for an additional search. No drugs or money were located. Sergeant Chabonier, along with Officers Dodd and Scannell, responded to the Shell gas station located at 77 L Street and spoke with Watson. P.O. Dodd read Watson as Miranda and he stated he understood his rights. When asked where the drugs were, Watson eventually replied, they're in my car in the compartment next to the steering wheel. P.O. Dodd entered the vehicle and located two clear plastic bags containing powder cocaine, approximately 17 grams, along with a digital scale. Watson stated to officers, I paid $300 for it. Watson additionally stated that he was a cocaine addict and was going through hard times. Watson was informed that he would be summoned into South Boston District Court for possession with intent to distribute Class B and possession of Class B. Due to his leg injury, Garcia was also informed that he'd be summoned into court for trafficking Class B along with distribution of Class B. All drugs were weighed together using a digital scale with a total approximate weight of 35 grams of cocaine recovered. The drugs were recorded in District C6 drug log, books 6 001, page number 31, and deposited in the C6 drug safe. A total of 2,700. $58 U.S. currency was seized from Garcia, all of which was brought to BPD HQ, where it was deposited into the financial evidence safe. A form 2012 was completed for both motor vehicles. That is the, uh, the essence of Sergeant Chabonier and Officer Dodd report. I responded after that, after we were notified that these incidents had taken place. And on 326, I'm sorry, that's...
Sorry, on 5 27 2021 at about 7 55 p.m sergeant detective william gallagher detective eddie hernandez assigned to licensed premise unit conducted a licensed premise inspection of the ellen fourth street market at 77 l street this inspection came about because of an incident that took place back on 3 26 21 at 1 p.m bpd incident report the last four at 9 3 4 1. During this incident, an employee of the Ellen Fourth Market was placed under arrest by members of the BPD C6 drug unit after observations were made of an employee, Mark Watson, involved in an illegal drug deal at 77 L Street with another individual identified as Anthony Garcia, who was also arrested. During the course of this investigation, cocaine and cash were recovered. The Ellen Fourth Market holds a City of Boston retail package license LB154430. As a result of what detectives were made aware of, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 048015 to Allen Fourth Market for illegality taking place on premise. Employee arrested for illegal drug sale. Ms. Ronnie Egan signed for an accepted notice. Those essentially are the facts of the report. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, well, Attorney Conway, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes. Um, as first, as a matter, I. At uh, approximately 9.15 this morning, I submitted to the board three different videos from the gas station. The first of the videos shows the interaction between the persons in the vehicles and Mr. Watson and the board can watch that. Uh, Mr. Miskinis was present at that time and he's going to testify as to what he had. The second video is when the police returned to the gas station and you will see when they detain Mr. Watson. The third video goes to what shows exactly what happened after Mr. Mr. Watson was uh, detained. You can see that he voluntarily allowed the police to search his vehicle. And after the search of the vehicle, the handcuffs were removed from, from him and he, uh, he, he went back to work and to date, he has not been summoned to the South Boston District Court. So I know Mr. Miskinis is at work, so I'd like to get, if I can um, have him testify first, and then I'd like to go through what our investigation has shown and what we believe will be backed up by the videos that we submitted this morning. Now, where'd you go? <laughs> Mr. McGinnis, are you, Miskinis, are you there with us? There he is. There, we need My you to unmute yourself. Not yeah, I am unmuted. I keep getting kicked. Okay. This isn't the ideal situation for this. Yes. Uh, were you present at the 77 L Street gas station at one o'clock on um, March 26? Excuse me. I think he may be frozen. Yeah. Well, we'll try to get back to him because I, what I'll do is I, I can go what went through with the um, went through with this. Mr. Um, Watson has been an employee, and when we went and were were found out about this, he told us the same thing basically that Mr. Garcia told the police that there was no hand to hand transaction, but that in fact the two of the the two people were smoking a joint, um, that that's what was going on. And you can see in the video them passing the joint to each other and then uh, Mr. Watson putting it down. Mr. Uh, Garcia then leaves and then coming back. Mr. Watson, of course, you know, at this point we would, couldn't ask to testify but he told us that the cocaine was not purchased that day, that it had been in his car for personal use and that, the, um, that no transaction had taken place that day. Uh, we believe that the, the video when board will be able to see it, all in all the three videos run about 17, 18 minutes that you'll see that, that there was no transaction and that Mr. Watson, and we have no reason to disbelieve what he has told us. With respect to the operation of the premises, 
this is a little package store that's in a store at the edge of the um, at the edge of the parking lot and the edge of the gas station. You can see the um, the videos that we've provided the board today are taken from on top of the entryway of the door to the package store. Mr. Watson, the, the store, even though they're owned by the same corporation are really run as two different businesses. Mr. Watson, other than to fill in when somebody has to, to go or to you know take a break or go to the bathroom has nothing to do with the alcohol operation. The alcohol operation is, is basically a separate store and we've had no problem. We've had, we have many security cameras everywhere and we, ha we have no problem with the sale and service of alcohol. We understand that Mr. Watson is an individual who has had some problems in the past, but he has been a good employee and we know that he is a, uh, the sole support for his family. Since the incident of March, Mr. Garcia, has not been on the premises. He is barred from the premises. And we have had no further incident with respect to this. So we just do want to emphasize for the board that there, there was no drug transaction we believe going on. Mr. Garcia is probably, uh, has is not allowed back. We did not know what he was doing, but we um, believe that we, we caught the situation. We're happy about it. Uh, we're happy that we were informed of it and we're keeping extra careful eyes on everybody in the, um, in the operation of the business. But we, ha we have separate management for the alcohol, the retail alcohol store. And that, is, that has basically nothing to do with the employment or the operation of Mr. Watson. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions? Does Mr. Watson still work there? Yes, he does. And under our supervision, as we said, we do know that Mr. Wat Mr. Watson um, is the sole support. He has a partner and a baby. Um, and after this, he has been pledged to, he's doing everything that he can to maintain his sobriety and that we, he has not been arrested. He has, he has not been summoned. We have told him that when, uh, if and when he is summoned to the South Boston District Court, that that's when we would revisit the, the um, situation. We've had no indication that he's been intoxicated under any, in any form while he is working and he has been, uh, what we would say would be, uh, you know, he does his job and he does, it, and we're watching him very, very closely. We still want, we didn't want to kick him out on the street when he had made this vow to us. And for the last three months to us, he has kept his vow. So who's the manager of record? Me. Chris. Oh, okay. Would you like to say anything? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so I didn't know this report that I got from uh, the police came two months later. So I had heard what happened outside. I got a call from the employees. So I went up there and I interrogated him. I searched through all the surveillance and watched him afterward. And he swears up and down there was no drug deal with that kid and he never sold drugs or bought drugs at the gas station. I have no evidence to say otherwise. So Chris. I'm sorry, I just saw that Mr. Miskinis is back on. <laughs> Mr. Miskinis, can you, you may be frozen again, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I'm unmuted. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, I, I'm going to ask you again. Were you at the um, Ellen Fourth Street Market at one o'clock on the date of this incident? No. Oh. Maybe I can make an offer of proof that Mr. Miskinis, you could see him in the video. Um, now, I'm glad you, you've been able to at least see him. He is in the first video, and he will testify that he saw the interaction between Mr. Watson but, and, and um, not, Mr. Mr. Garcia. Uh, no, no, I didn't see any interaction. You didn't see any drug dealing, is that correct? No, I went up there to smoke 
smoke a cigarette, I got a coffee. I'm not sure what I did, but I don't see any transaction or any of that shit stuff. So. Okay, thank you. So and, um, Detective Charbonnier was at this location because of um, reports of drug activity. Station, were you aware of yeah. any reports or suspicions of drug activity? At I'm sorry you broke up. I broke up? Yes. Can you yep, can no, you guys can, hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. My question is Detective Charbonnier was conducting surveillance of the gas station because of um, suspicions of drug activity at this location. Were you aware of those suspicions of the drug activity? Chris? No, absolutely not. Okay. I mean, I this read is, the report. This is basically a, a store that's mostly a Dunkin' Donuts and it has alcohol. We, the people who come to the store are usually locals from the neighborhood uh, and we had no indication. But as you said, we've got a, what when you see the video, we've got a pretty good you know surveillance there, and you're going to be able to see. Okay. All right, um, Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon. Um, do you have any thoughts on your employee engaging in cannabis smoking with someone who's operating a motor vehicle? Um, well, so when I saw that in the surveillance, I suspended him for two days. Now I was looking for cocaine involved activity. Um, Mark Watson, he knows he shouldn't be smoking at work. Um, so I suspended him and yet yeah, no, um, it isn't good that he's smoking with someone driving a, a vehicle in and out of there. Um, I also don't no, if I, I believe, I have to watch the video again, but I believe that the other guy is the one who brought the weed and, and passed it to Mark. Well, and, and I do, do want to emphasize that Mr. Garcia is banned from the premises. Yeah, you told us that. Yeah. Okay, and so based on this police report, you're telling us that you have no reason to believe that there was drug activity going on and, and that the police just got lucky on this one day to, to see this, this supposed interaction and cocaine was found on both parties? We did not have any notice of, of anything along that lines, um, especially since, you know, everything, you know, it, everything was working, you know, the gas station was operating and everything was going on. We, we didn't see it. And, um, you know, as I said, it, we are very vigilant at this point now. We understand that there are concerns and we make sure that uh, Chris is watching the security cameras at, at all times. My question is going forward, after the fact, after getting the police report, after finding out that cocaine was found on both parties, that the police were observing the area because of reports, however unconfirmed they are, but the one time they come and look, they see an interaction. It looks like a, and you're, you're saying you're, you're willing to give Mr. Watson that much benefit of the doubt and still have him on your premises and still have him potentially selling alcohol because you said that the, the corporations are, you know, basically separate, but they're really not separate. I mean, they're operating as one business. So th this man, Mr. Watson, um, you're willing to give him that much benefit of the doubt under these circumstances? Well, as I said, his his interaction with the alcohol is minuscule because he's basically but, but it's, pumping it's gas. It's potentiality, right? If well, I thought he sold drugs from my legitimate business, I would fire him right away. So I don't think he is. You're willing, you're willing to say that he there's no way he was involved in drug transactions ever. No, he obviously was when he attained that cocaine. But we don't believe he we don't believe that he got it on our premises. That's all I have. Commissioner Saxon, did you have any questions? 
Yeah, how many employees were there at the time of the incident? Was it just him? Two. Two, Two gas employees. station attendants. Okay, and where was that other gas station attendant? Does, does that video, does the video show that second gas station yes. attendant? Yes, you will see him working as well. No. And he so doesn't. There's a clerk inside who sells the items in the store. And there's the kid who pumps gas because it's full service. So the attendant inside is the one who notified me something was going on outside. And the gas station, does the video, does it appear that the person outside, does it appear that he is witnessing anything or is he just well, actually, that's why we have Mr. Miskinis here with us because he it's the video shows him standing there, um, look, you know, looking at these the two cars. You could see him. That's why we thought he would be the best best witness uh, for us to bring. Um, and the other attendant is just basically you could see just working. It's a busy gas station. Thank you very much. The board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Calling the Hospitality Inc. doing business as Hava Lounge located at 246 Tremont Street. The date of the incident is May 29th, 2021. Failure to maintain line in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Is there anyone present on behalf of Page Hospitality? Take a second call. Calling GSTH Investment Group, LLC, doing business as Bijou and Rock and Rye, located at 51 Stewart Street. The date of the incident was May 30th, 2021. Overcrowding, 359 house count, 345 capacity in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64 in board's rules 1.03 J, 1.06 A and F, failure to maintain aisles in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good afternoon, Madam Secretary, Stephen Miller, uh, McDermott, Quilty and Miller. Um, I believe Mete Aslan is, I can see he's on. I just cut a text from James Driscoll, who's the manager of record that he's at the VA hospital. He was on for quite a while, but he's now seeing a doctor. But um, I think Mr. Aslan is, um, would be sufficient to um, testify on this. Uh, Mr. Driscoll is the manager of record and did want to participate. He's also a director of security, but he may come back on before the hearing's over. All right, thank you. Who's going to be testifying on behalf of the Boston Police Department? I will be. Detective Fernandez. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Mete, you might want to put your camera on. I'm on. We can see him. We can see Mr. Aslan. Oh, you can see him? Okay. Um, could all parties please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I Thank you. Detective, you can proceed with the police report. Good afternoon, I'll be reading from a police report, which I wrote on Saturday, May 30th, 2021, charge Detective Gallagher and Detective Eddie Hernandez assigned to the BPD license premise unit, conducted a license premise inspection of Bijou, located at 54 Stewart Street in Boston. When detectives walked inside, detectives asked the door staff what the counter patrons inside the establishment was. The staff stated that they had a count of 359 patrons. Detectives were aware that the capacity of the second floor of the premise was set at 345 persons. Detectives tried to perform a mechanical count of the establishment, but were unable to accomplish it because all the aisles to walk around on the floor were unpassable. Detectives could only estimate that the capacity of the floor was well over 400 patrons. Detectives brought this to the attention of the person in charge, Mr. James Driscoll. Mr. Driscoll stated he would bring the establishment into compliance as a result of what detectives observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license permits inspection 
notice 048020 for overcrowding of the establishment and failure to maintain an aisle. The subject will sign for and accepted the notice. That is all. Thank you, Detective. Uh, Attorney Miller, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, uh, Detective Hernandez, did Mr. Driscoll take immediate action um, based on, on your report and your observance? Yes, sir. And have you and Sergeant Gallagher been back to the premises since this uh, evening? Yes, we have. And uh, did you notice particularly any change? Well, certainly to compliance with the, with the uh, overcrowding issue, but also um, any actions taken by the licensee as far as uh, keeping the aisles clear? Yes, they do. They now have established lanes on both sides of the floor there that which partitions uh, would uh, stanchions so that uh, you can now get, make it across, go around the whole floor. That, that was based on recommendations, I think, by both you and, and Sergeant Gallagher. Yes, sir. To correct the issue. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Detective. Uh, so, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, uh, Mete Aslan is is on. Um, he can describe as far as the staff on that evening. Um, I can give you a brief overview. They had three staff members outside. They had two staff members inside checking IDs. You then walk past the cashier, pay the cashier, and then the person that was responsible for keeping the count um, is after the cashier. Um, his responsibility was keep track of people entering and also keep track of the people as they leave and ask them whether they were smoking or non-smoking so he could keep track of the um, number of people on the premises. He um, was trained, but he's new, like a lot of the places uh, having trouble getting staff and he was asked not to, uh, with the capacity of 345, he was asked for not to exceed 335. And yet um, when the uh, sergeant and detective uh, asked him what he had for a count, it was 359. Um, Mete, can you describe what you've done um, with the staff since this incident, both concerning the um, keeping the, an accurate count and also what you've done for, uh, on, uh, as Detective Hernandez has already uh, testified to it, I know you've done work um, to keep the aisles, but also what you've done with the staff to have them understand the importance of the capacity issue and also keeping the aisles, aisles clear. And so this individual that we had at the door on uh, the clicker, um, he was new to the staff. Um, we used our experienced people at the front door uh, with car control and um, checking IDs. And uh, this gentleman was trained for the prior week on how to do the capacity. And we tried to explain to him how it could get hectic during uh, certain times. We don't let smokers come out till about 12 o'clock. But um, during the night, we might make an exception when they want to leave early. So I think between the smoke he's leaving and patrons leaving through the, throughout the night, he, uh, he screwed up on the count at the door. And we had told him to let us know at 3.35 on his clicker to um, uh, let the management know so that we could stop the door. And at this point, we don't know where the disconnect was, but uh, when the sergeant and the detective asked him for the count, he had a higher number than our uh, capacity. Um, after, the, after the violation, um, my manager and Jim Driscoll at the time, uh, they trained them for two more days on premises on how to do the clickers and to be calm and ask people when they're leaving if they're going for smoking, where they get a stamp so that they don't get recounted when they come back in or if they're leaving for the night. And they took two good days with him to train him on this. Uh, running scenarios and everything. Um, and he ran it last week and uh, we thought it was a very good number and he, he was very accurate with his numbers. Um, as far as the aisles being cleared, um, we took the recommendation of the detective and sergeant and we put ropes all around the perimeter so that it's a very easy walking area. Um, 
And uh, we have security walking around the whole time um, and basically clearing the aisles if there's anybody in the aisles also. And you've also done retraining of the staff, of the inside staff yes. concerning the aisles. Is that correct? And that's, and that's what I was getting at. Basically, um, so security will walk around and make sure all the aisles are cleared, all the exit ways are um, clear. Um, so uh, they've been trained on that also extensively. And before every night we do an upfront and this is reiterated to everybody on the staff and each person that's hosting a post, um, they will get an uh, individual meeting with Jim Driscoll and Joey, um, our G uh, GM at the time, on what they're supposed to do if they're by the exit, if they're by the cashier taking tickets, uh, doing the accounts, outside crowd control. Um, and um, I think uh, we're getting better. I mean, we just opened up after 15 months, but you know, uh, we're not using that as an excuse, but we're, uh, we're really training the staff as we go. I don't, I don't have anything else, Madam Chair. Thank you. Chairman Joyce, do you have any questions for the licensee? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Kern or Commissioner Saxon? None for me. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Saxon, no questions? All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Will, thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement. Thank, Thank you. you. Calling 325 LLC, located at 81 Fairmount Avenue. The date of the notice is May 20th, 2021. Informational hearing regarding non-use of license in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good afternoon, board members. Ms. Hawkins, John P. Connell for the licensee. And I believe uh, John Button is here. I see his name. So you need to remove the mute and the video block. Mr. Button, if you could please unmute yourself and turn on your, uh, your camera. How's that? Great, thank you. Can and you hear me now? We can, and as thank you. an informational hearing, there is no police report, no need to swear in the participants. Uh, this hearing was called because the board has put on notice that this licensed premise, which has a CV seven day all alcoholic beverages license, has not been operational for a significant amount of time. As attorney Cannell is aware, it is a violation of mass general law to uh, hold a liquor license that is inactive. The board did suspend non-use during the COVID pandemic. However, the non-use of this license predates the pandemic um, and the board is now hearing matters on non-use. Attorney Canal. Yes, um, briefly. The uh, use ceased in approximately September 2019 before COVID. Uh, the, Mr. Button is both the manager owner of the licensee. He is also the property owner or the landlord. Uh, in September and into the fall, Mr. Button was attempting to either uh, get a new tenant or sell the restaurant and at the very worst, sell the license. Then COVID came along and now COVID has come and gone, hopefully, and the, the license with the restaurant is back on the market with the broker and Mr. Button is attempting to get a new tenant in there. All right, so as you are aware, you have now been put on notice of the non-use. You have six months to cure the non-use. Attorney Cannell, please keep the board updated as you move forward with this transaction. Thank you. Thank you. We will take a second call for Page Hospitality. Is there anyone present from Page Hospitality? All right, for the record, the licensee has failed to appear. We will address this with them. Those are all the items before the board today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.